In this world, the only way is up. In any modern city street, the enormous impact of this great invention is all around you, even though you probably can't see it. The trade-off with building ever taller buildings is that you need to find increasingly ingenious ways of getting those people up the top. And the sky isn't even the limit. We're reaching for the stars. Imagine the views you'd see. It would be amazing. But what invention connects our city streets with exploring, mining, and parking our cars? And we'd have a very different looking world if we didn't have that. But in the early days, this invention was involved in so many accidents, it took patience and ingenuity to make it safe. Then, we couldn't stop building without it. Our developed world would feel flat and monotonous if we didn't have it. So it's completely central to how the modern world has been built. It carries us, helps us, saves our energy, yet we take it for granted. We could not live without it now or in the future. This is the story of the rise and rise of the elevator. Look around the world's great cities and what dominates the skyline? More and more, we build up rather than out to save on land space. And the reason we can go up and up and down is thanks to a small box, a vertical people carrier, which can stop safely when we want it to and saves us climbing flights and flights of stairs. I've been on 30, 40 stories up, and obviously there's no way in hell I'd want to do that via stairs. The elevator's a great invention because what it's enabled us to do is to build a whole world and to live in that world safely and comfortably that would have been unimaginable before the 19th century. The elevator has allowed more people to work in the same building, more people to live in the vicinity of their workplace. So the elevator allows you to get up, which of course means you can build up. So now you can build more stuff on a smaller piece of land. And as land gets more and more expensive, particularly in urban environments, then that's a good thing to do, potentially. In 2016, China's Shanghai Tower set an astonishing new world record with the fastest elevator in the world. It travels at about 74 kilometers per hour, faster than the average city speed limit. In 2017, at the Lot World Tower in Seoul, an elevator called the Sky Shuttle was unveiled. It's the world's tallest and fastest double-deck elevator. Elevators are an enabler, a convenience. But what gave us the idea to invent them in the first place? In the horizontal world of our ancestors, why did we feel the need to travel mechanically upwards? Sadly, there is no evidence remaining of how we reach the tops of our ancient, highest buildings. The pyramids are a lasting example of man's vision and ability to stretch the limits of early construction techniques to create magnificent structures without any kind of primitive elevator. Of course, we were able to build high long before the invention of elevators. I mean, the pyramids are... Uh, immense amounts of human uh, manual labor went into building the, these incredible structures. Uh, it just meant that if you wanted to get to the top of them, you have to use your good old leg power. We may not have had elevators to lift people, but 5,000 years ago, ancient Egyptian engineers invented the very simplest lifting machines to pull off their extraordinary feats of architectural design and construction. Those simple lifting machines became a bit more sophisticated under the ancient Greeks about 2,000 years after the Egyptians. This reconstruction gives an idea of how the Parthenon in Athens was built in 447 BCE. 
This was the era of the great Archimedes. His was a brilliantly inventive mind, fascinated by mechanics and the development of simple machines. One of the earliest examples appears to be Archimedes, or at any rate is attributed to Archimedes, and it's a, a pulley system that enables you to carry things up and down. Archimedes is known as the father of experimental science and helped our understanding of how a pulley works. Essentially, it saves us a lot of effort moving things up and down. A pulley is really quite simple. You have an object, uh, you'll need a counterweight of the same mass of that object. You connect them with a, with a rope or a cable of some sort, and then you just have a, a winch at the top. And you know, by using the tension in the rope, that, that is perfectly balanced. The force is completely balanced out. So um, it, it means that that is a stable configuration, no matter how high the thing is, which may go against what your intuition is, but you know, often is the case with physics, is that your intuition can be wrong. You only have to look at Roman architecture to realize how much we could achieve with a simple, primitive elevating machine. The Romans' invention, based on a pulley, was really a service elevator. Historians believe that in the Colosseum, there was a system of elevators to carry wild animals and gladiators from the lower floors up to the arena to fight. So this early, we began elevating people. There are medieval examples of things being lifted, uh, platforms being lifted up and down, powered by mules, <laughs> powered by people sometimes. We did have incredibly tall buildings before, big cathedrals and things like that. Imagine the sort of labor that was involved, not only in building that high without any sort of mechanical support, but also just getting up there all the time. Segovia Cathedral in Spain is an example, now part of a World Heritage Site. Construction began in 1525 on one of the highest spots in the city which only added to the challenge. The top of the nave is 33 meters high. Elevator technology would surely have been helpful, but pulleys and platforms were better than nothing. I think church builders of yore and cathedral builders would have been very ecstatic about the elevator. The height of the spires was, you know, and to a certain extent, constrained by how high we could get. So if you can get higher, then you can build higher. Dutch houses had hooks in their gables to attach a pulley rope to hoist goods up and down from the upper floors, at least as early as the 17th century. The principle still works today. Or you can use a 21st century lifting platform to whiz your bulky items up to a top floor apartment on a furniture hoist like this. Meanwhile, that prehistoric invention, steps, had been developed into domestic staircases. We started building taller homes using a staircase to reach the upper floors. But they didn't satisfy everyone. There were those with power and money who could afford to commission an elevating device to carry them from one floor to another to save them taking the stairs. In the Palace of Whitehall in 16th century London, a very large King Henry VIII was having mobility problems. Historians believe his leg was injured in a jousting competition in 1536. A contraption was installed in which servants would have pulled the weighty monarch up and down on a stair lift chair by hand. It probably took quite a few of them. The lift must have been immensely strong when he died 11 years later, Henry VIII weighed 180 kilograms. Royals seem to have liked an elevator. At the Chateau de Versailles, King Louis XV of France allowed a sliding chair to be installed by his mistress in the 18th century. It saved the poor lady from using the stairs for her visits to the king. 
Industrialization demanded bigger scale everything, including factories. Moving goods around these larger, taller buildings required an inventive solution. There are obviously precursors, which is about moving platforms up and down, but they're deeply unsafe. And they can only be done to a certain extent, so long as you know that at any moment you could plunge to the bottom. The technology was open to adaptation like this, hoisting an injured person down the mountain to a hospital. Nowadays, the technology is mainly used by ski vacationers. The first ski lift was put into operation in Germany in 1908. Since then, winter sports enthusiasts no longer have to climb mountains. They're simply pulled up by one of over 22,000 ski lifts in the world. Two hundred years ago, industrialists were greedy to move quantity quickly, but they had to be careful how heavy they made each load on their elevating machines. Using hemp rope, however thick and well made, it wasn't always up to the job. It was liable to rot and snap or to wear thin. Something stronger was needed. Around the middle of the 19th century, engineers started replacing rope with steel wire, and that remained the material of choice for the next 100 years or more. Factories are being built on multiple floors. You were starting to see the early signs of what are going to be skyscrapers. But the fact is, people can't be confident that the elevators they're using are wholly safe, and the alternative is stairs. Replacing wire for rope worked up to a point, but the constant bending and straining over the winches made the wire wear out quickly, and its durability was as yet unknown. The quest for super strong materials to winch our elevators up and down is as crucial today as ever, if we are to build even higher. But what has this little guy got to do with improving the strength and resilience of elevator cables? There is always hope that the natural world will provide amazing natural solutions, instead of us having to figure out synthetic ones. Will the bases of spider silk really hold the answer for cabling technological development? Throughout civilization, we've always been taking lessons from nature by mimicry, taking things we've seen and applying them in engineering, in structures, and in medicine and health. Spider silk is a very strong material, and it's also a very fine material. And scientists have found that spider silk is comparable to steel in tensile strength. In 1990, a spider silk gene was cloned for the first time and subsequently produced enough silk for us to weave. But so far, mass production on a commercial scale of any super strong spider silk rope has remained a pipe dream. Now and in the future, carbon fiber is proving much more likely to yield solutions in the search for stronger and importantly, lighter weight cables. The higher we build, the more cable we need for the elevators to work and the heavier they'll be. So it has become vital that we develop lighter cables to keep overall weight to a minimum. Elevators require a cable to carry the elevator, but the cables themselves have a self-weight as well as the load. Therefore, by reducing the self-weight of a cable, we can actually reduce the load in general. By doing this, we can have elevators that go larger, and they can go in larger structures and go higher. So when engineers are developing a new cabling solution, how do they make sure it works? How can they test safely? In a country where there are no skyscrapers, lies the world's largest high-rise testing facility for new elevator cables, in an active limestone mine in Finland. But they're not measuring its height from the ground up. The elevator shaft starts 305 meters underground and can test elevator systems up to a kilometer high. 
engineers here have been working on a new high-tech cabling system using a lightweight carbon fiber core instead of steel. They've discovered that super light cables mean the elevator can go further and faster and cuts the amount of energy needed. To demonstrate the cable strength and stress tolerance, they put a wristwatch at the bottom of the elevator shaft. The car is put into an accelerating freefall, then stopped abruptly, and the cables hold it fast. The watch survives intact, apart from a light coating of dust. Testing this kind of futuristic technology is crucial to feed our aspiration to build even higher in the 21st century. And we want to travel deeper underground. Industrialization saw mine owners install crude, open-sided cage elevators, which were crammed with workers as they traveled down to the coalface. In fact, the world's longest elevator is in the world's deepest gold mine, Mponang in South Africa. The elevator travels a staggering almost 2.3 kilometers into the depths. But back in the 19th century, there were very few people brave enough to travel in an elevator, even in factories. What got the ball rolling was the first enclosed space to carry people called an ascending room. It was opened in London in 1829 for 12 tourists at a time to pay and admire the view, even though the elevator wasn't entirely safe. What could happen then still happens very occasionally today. Cables can break, and it's terrifying. In 2018, in this Chicago skyscraper, at least one cable snapped. The elevator plunged 84 stories with six people trapped inside. Everyone survived, thanks to a life-saving mechanism. As elevators developed, we couldn't stop cables breaking. But what about breaking the fall? Elisha Otis is the man we have to thank for inventing the ingenious component that changed the future of elevators a break. In 1854, he took an enormous gamble and demonstrated his new invention under the glare of an audience. The spectacle was breathtaking. Such was his faith in his brainchild that Otis hoisted his elevator to the top of the building. Elisha Otis came up with a really cool mechanism that was basically a rudimentary safety brake. There were sort of these metal teeth all the way up the lift shaft. And if the rope broke, these hooks, which were sort of attached to springs, would spring outwards and get caught in the metal teeth, making the lift stop dead in its tracks. And he even demonstrated this bravely by standing on a platform and telling a guy with an ax to cut through the rope. And to everyone's shock, he sort of fell but then stopped. And thus the confidence to build elevators came from there. Everything changed almost overnight in the building trade, thanks to Elisha Otis. We could build up and up with an easy way of ensuring people didn't have to walk flights and flights of stairs. The safety lift enables you to be confident that when you get into the lift, it will go up and it will come down and you will not die. And that you know, is something that's absolutely necessary. And that's what amazes people when Otis brings this to the New York World's exhibition, is that they're able to see this is something that's safe. Most people don't like new technology. They're kind of suspicious of it. Until the point it stops sucking, basically. It actually becomes useful. The braking system made the mass adoption of elevators possible because the biggest fear people have walking into elevators is going to fall, and now they were told that even if it falls, you're going to be OK. The world would never be the same again thanks to the elevator's safety brake. Now that lifts could be trusted, progress picked up speed. The technology proved versatile. From 1875, we could carry a barge from one canal to another at a lower height. The barge moves into the elevator at the upper level and is lifted down to the other 
or vice versa. In 1880, German electrical engineer Ernst Werner von Siemens devised the next innovation, the world's first electric elevator. That was followed quite quickly by automatically closing doors to the elevator shaft. For a long time, elevators had two sets of doors, the shaft doors on each floor and the elevator cabin's own doors. Both had to be locked manually and couldn't be opened or locked unless the elevator had stopped at a landing. Even the burgeoning car industry benefited from the new elevator technology. The first vertical car parking elevator opened in France in 1905. Why take up lots of room with turning circles when you can simply stack cars one on top of the other? For a period in the 20th century, we had elevator operators in fancy hotels who would take care of opening and closing the doors and select which floors to stop at. Now this luxury is reserved for a few exclusive venues and skyscraper tourist attractions. Elevators were significant in the creation of many of the world's most iconic tall buildings. Our cityscapes would look utterly different if it hadn't been for Elisha Otis. You just need to look at the skyline of somewhere like New York across the 19th century. New York just grows, and it grows out. But more interestingly, it grows up. People want to stay on Manhattan. People want to be where the action is. They can't afford to buy up multiple blocks. And so what they do is just build up and up and up. The Paris skyline would not look the same without its famous icon, the Eiffel Tower. For the first 40 years, it was the world's tallest building. The city planners wanted to protect the aesthetic of the old city by allowing no more tall buildings to be erected. The result? is that the Eiffel Tower stands out to this day. And the skyscrapers are mainly confined to a separate space outside the city limits, where you could be in any 21st century downtown. The Eiffel Tower is one of the most popular tourist attractions in France. And what do you do? You go up it, probably by elevator. From 1889, you could still walk up the 1,710 stairs if you wanted to to reach the first floor. But why not take one of the four elevators and save your legs? It proved that the elevator was to play another crucial role in society, in tourism. The elevator's hugely important in tourism. The Eiffel Tower's tall, and you can walk up by steps, but you really feel it at the end. It's the elevator that makes it a tourist attraction. The Eiffel Tower's modern elevators are so busy they're said to travel the equivalent of two and a half times around the world each year. Elevators can become tourist attractions in their own right, like this one in Lisbon, completed in 1902. The Santa Justa transports visitors from one district to another, 45 meters up. Originally, it was part of the city's transport network, but now it's often full of tourists wanting to sample vintage Portugal. That's super short compared to the elevators here in the world's tallest building. Burj Khalifa in Dubai stands at 828 meters high. 21st century tourists love it. It's in the top 10 of the world's biggest attractions. Altogether, there are 57 elevators in the building. But if you want to walk instead up to level 160, you can take the 2,909 stairs. The cool thing about the Burj Khalifa lifts and all these other you know, very modern, very fast lifts is that they found a way to accelerate them relatively slowly, so it's quite a smooth process. So you still feel an increased force downwards in the beginning, but because it accelerates slowly, that force is sort of spread out over a longer period of time. The contemporary experience of traveling in an elevator like this can be unnerving. Zooming upwards or downwards at relative speed can make your ears pop 
and give you a slightly weightless feeling. It's just an elevator, not a jet plane. What's going on? This is a classic example of Newtonian physics, the laws of motion. I'm sure you've noticed when you're standing in an elevator and it suddenly starts going up, you'll feel heavier. And that's because not only on top of the force of gravity, you've got this upward force of the, the bottom of the elevator acting on your feet and legs as it pushes you up. It increases the, the effects of gravity and that's why you feel a sort of positive g-force. Similarly, if you start going down an elevator, in those first few moments as, you, as the elevator accelerates, uh, the force of gravity is lessened and so you'll feel temporarily lighter. Gravitational force, or g-force, will always come into play if you move quickly upwards or downwards. So designers have to consider this. The higher we go, the more you have to think about how, how can we make elevators that can get to those heights in not a long amount of time, but it also don't subject your body to horrible g-forces that are going to make you feel pretty sick or anxious or things like that. And that's why you start to see more efficient elevators that will accelerate you up very slowly to high speeds so that you don't notice as, um, as much. The architects and engineers designing Burj Khalifa have succeeded in providing an extraordinary elevator experience. On holiday, I rode up the Burj Khalifa, and what I really noticed was that I didn't notice anything. I didn't notice a speed change, I didn't notice any discomfort, I didn't even feel sick in my stomach thinking, oh, I'm going on this nervous ride. It was simply so smooth, and that is how developed we are in the technology that we use for elevators today, they're so smooth and they transition so well that you can go up a span of a huge distance in no time at all, and you wouldn't even know it. According to one estimate, an average well-maintained office elevator makes about 400,000 trips per year. An average worker uses the elevator eight times a day. The likelihood of this worker getting stuck is 0.01% per year. The vast majority of elevators don't break down very often. When they do get stuck with people inside, it's called, in the elevator trade, a man trap. The unofficial record for being stuck is a terrifying 41 hours. It happened in a New York office building. No one was hurt but it was a long time to go without food or water. But the benefits of elevators surely outweigh the small risk of a man trap. Elevators made it possible for us not only to work in tall buildings, but to live in them as well. These days, high-rise living is more often than not a lifestyle choice. Many people love it and enjoy the view. Wherever you live, humans are great adapters. If you're living on the 34th floor, you adapt to the 34th floor and you kind of forget about the view. It's only when somebody visits and goes, oh my gosh, look at your amazing view. You go, oh yeah. So we, I think wherever you put people, if they've chosen to be there, they like it, they get used to it. By the end of the 19th century, in most cities, we were already used to buildings of six or seven floors without elevators. Like these traditional apartment buildings in Paris, the vision of the city's planner Baron George Hausmann. Richer folk lived on the prestigious second floor. After that, the poorer you were, the higher up the building you lived, and the more stairs. Many tenement buildings, like these in Glasgow, still with outdoor staircases, were originally built to house the influx of manual workers needed in the Industrial Revolution. Elevators paved the way for the development of social housing in great volume and at height. Well, what it makes possible is the vertical stacking of people on a scale that hadn't been achieved before. It grows out of a tradition so tenement blocks already existed in New York. Um, office blocks already existed in New York. What the elevator enables you to do is to just do that on scale. Following the initial invention, technology breakthroughs allowed us to install ever more efficient lifts of different shapes and sizes to suit buildings with different purposes. 
tower blocks became a one-stop solution to a housing shortage in the post-war construction boom, following obliteration by bombs or slum clearance. Good quality, affordable housing was needed by hundreds of thousands of people all over Europe. Tower block building is characteristic of social housing, in which the elevator is a, a sign that you are being looked after. It's a sign that you're part of the modern world. This building in Marseille revolutionized social housing. Its Swiss-born architect, known by his pseudonym Le Corbusier, had a vision of streets in the sky in this first example of brutalist architecture. I think the positives are seen as, you know, having all these people living together in these spaces, using the elevators will give them much more of that sociability and connectivity. Elevators provided a lifeline to people who would otherwise struggle to get around. I think elevators are an important invention because they they have a social role to play because somebody with a disability in a wheelchair, parents with prams or shopping bags or all of that can get from A to B really quickly. And I think without that, you know, life becomes, for some people, an insurmountable struggle. So they are very important. However, elevators were not a universal panacea to make mass housing palatable and living in a high-rise wasn't always as dreamy as the architects envisaged. Living at height on different floors from your friends took a bit of getting used to. Ultimately, for shy, infirm, or elderly people, for example, it could be isolating. There is kind of this sociability in the sky that can develop. But that's not true for everybody. I mean, some people can move into these apartments, use those elevators every day, and still feel completely lonely and isolated because they don't feel that same connection. In some cases, building up and living in streets in the sky isn't always a step closer to heaven. One of the biggest indicators of where you live a long and happy life is how socialized you are. And high-rise blocks, they generally have less social cohesion because people are not interacting on an even level. The sadness, of course, is that in lots of examples, the rich, their elevator works well. For the poor, the elevator stops functioning because it's not well looked after enough. And so what you end up with is the worst of all possible worlds, which is high-rise living, but without the thing, the elevator, that's meant to make the high-rise work. Elevators that aren't maintained properly and constantly break down or are vandalized can become a bad joke when you live in a multi-story tower. But it's no joke climbing the stairs. Yet we can't live without elevators. What more can we aim for? Constructing ever taller buildings presents logistical challenges with thousands of people moving around daily, all expecting a speedy, reliable elevator at the touch of a button. Smart buildings now and in the future will have intelligent elevators that monitor the flow of people and lift journeys. Then maintenance can be planned for quiet times and potential problems predicted and solved before they become a crisis. But there's another hidden problem looming that could have a profound effect on the way we build up in the future. Have you ever been aware of a super tall building swaying in the wind? It can be imperceptible or in strong winds, really quite noticeable. Buildings are like really dynamic. The higher you go, the, the, the more subjected to kind of wind forces and, and sway and torsion and all things like that. So they actually need to be able to react to that. They are not rigid things in the way that we think of them. They're swaying and twisting and turning. And it's not just the building. The elevator shafts inside it move too. It's another consideration that keeps architects awake at night. The trade-off with building ever taller buildings is that you need to find increasingly in ingenious ways of getting those people up the top. Um, and so elevator design in these modern super tall buildings, there seems to be a sort of physical limit on how tall of an elevator that we can build. Where the elevator shafts are situated in the building makes a difference. The elevator also presents a design difficulty 
for architects, which is the question of where you put the elevator. Do you put the elevator in the middle? And once you do that, you create a core around which buildings are going to be arranged. Or do you put the elevator on the outside, which then creates all sorts of other problems. So there is a way in which the function of the elevator and the form of the elevator begins to dictate the wider function and form of the building. And then there's the whole other problem of people who simply can't get into an elevator, however high up it's going. I've come across people who won't go in elevators. They've developed a, a phobia about it because, you know, they, they think something bad is going to happen. So that's kind of excessive fear that something terrible is going to happen. Now, sometimes that can be as a result of something did happen. Somebody did get stuck in a lift because, you know, elevators can get stuck. And, and therefore that's a rational fear. You've actually been in that situation and you felt claustrophobic, you felt you couldn't get out, you couldn't escape. Um, but there are other people who've also learned those behaviors from hearing other people's stories. What if the lift is outside? Perhaps that might be even more scary for some people. The highest outdoor elevator in the world is in a national park in China. Taking the long double-deck elevator journey is the only way to reach a particular viewing platform. But for most people who think nothing of stepping into an elevator, there's an unseen danger to themselves that we're only just beginning to investigate. Today, living at height can bring a certain kudos. Apartment blocks with great views and large picture windows to enjoy them can fetch top dollar prices in a competitive property market. The elevator becomes a symbol uh, of the modern world. It becomes a sign that you are part of the modern world and it proves highly attractive to the very rich who want to live in these high-rise apartments. But there may be a hidden danger, an insidious effect on people's health, working and living at height. Researchers at the University of Bath are investigating the physical effects and possible harm done by low-frequency motion. It can cause Sopite syndrome, which is a kind of motion sickness bringing lethargy and drowsiness. It's the sort of motion that we use when we rock babies to sleep. So it's sort of inbuilt in the human response. And so we really need to understand what the cause of that is and what the onset of that is and how we can prevent that from happening. The new research is eagerly anticipated by architects and planners. Moving this purpose-built room backwards and forwards and side to side replicates the kinds of sway felt in a very tall building in severe weather, such as high winds, typhoons, and hurricanes, even earthquakes. Some of the world's tallest skyscrapers are in major earthquake zones, like Japan, which experiences 100,000 quakes a year. In the UAE, where seismic activity is common, the very top of Burj Khalifa will move up to two meters. Until now, there has been little research done into the effects on people living and working inside super tall buildings. What people don't really understand enough about is how much movement is acceptable for people, how people respond to being in tall buildings, and so understand how they respond to the sway motion and how we can then use that information to inform more efficient design of buildings so it's fit for humans. As skyscraper designs move to the next level, elevator design will have to be fit for purpose. But the considerations of the future will be different from the past. 
will we build so high? What effect will concerns about the planet's future have on building design and elevator technology? There will still be need for tall buildings in some places. There will still be a need for elevators. And so what we've got to do is to find a way of doing that using energy sources that are safe, using materials that are durable, and, uh, you know, in doing to elevators what we're trying to do to every sort of technology, which is to make it as green as we possibly can. Architects and city planners are aware that we need to consider building upwards sympathetically to the existing environment, as well as creating tall buildings that we want to live and work in and feel comfortable in. One of the great lessons of the last generation has been that you can achieve very high levels of population density with medium-sized buildings, that actually they work every bit as well and probably better than building very high buildings. And that lesson might teach us something about how we manage not to build up or out. We just densify the cities we've got already. That could mean constructing connected buildings in clusters, thanks to futuristic elevator design. Elevator engineers are creating concepts that move people up, down, and left and right. This groundbreaking design has no cables at all. It works by direct drive from a linear motor fitted inside the elevator cabin. No need for a machine room to house motors and winches. There can be multiple cabins in a shaft which circulate rather than always traveling in the same direction. So buildings can be connected horizontally as well as vertically. But in the world of elevator research and development, there's a truly mind-blowing project on the cards which would make science fiction turn into reality. Just how high could an elevator take us in the future? It's a 21st century space race. NASA says it's possible. The Japanese say they can build one. The Chinese say they can build one sooner. The space elevator. It would give us a platform in space that's tethered to planet Earth. Astronauts would be able to travel up an enormous elevator tower to reach the International Space Station. And we'd use it to launch satellites. Although it would cost billions to build, the theory is that it would save huge amounts of money in rocket launches. Space elevators are this brilliant idea of, that, you know, instead of having to rely on rockets to get things up into space, what if we could build um, essentially a building that's so tall that it goes into space? Launching a satellite can cost anything between $10 million and $400 million, depending on the size of the rocket carrying it into space. The liftoff itself is one of the most expensive elements. The space elevator would eliminate that cost and bring the overall satellite launch in at 5% or less of the current cost. Experts say it will have paid for itself possibly $90 billion after around 50 launches. It would put satellites straight into geostationary orbit, past the region where Earth's gravity is strongest. That means it would stretch over 35,000 kilometers from sea level. Scientists say we have the technology. It's just a question of figuring out a few challenges but it could be a reality by 2050. Imagine the views you'd see. It would be amazing. The space elevator is, a, is an ingenious idea uh, that could potentially um, make getting things into space a lot easier. Um, you know, rockets are prohibitively expensive in terms of you need to get things up to a very high speed to escape Earth's gravity, uh, and then you have to throw half of it away. The hurdles are enormous. Building a structure sky high means it'll reach the sphere of millions of bits of space debris or unpredictable super fast meteorites, which could crash into it. 
the elevator structure would have to withstand the weather in Earth's upper atmosphere, as well as influences from the sun, such as radiation. It's going to have to be pressurized and sealed, or everybody, I guess, would have to wear a spacesuit. Um, so there's lots of tricky things to consider, but it could be, once it's built, an incredibly uh, energy-efficient way of getting people outside of Earth's gravity and off into space. It promises to be environmentally sustainable, but extraordinarily difficult to pull off. The final elevator design will be literally out of this world. Up until recently, we haven't had the engineering or the materials to even consider making such a thing. We're now getting to the stage where people are beginning to test that idea. It's a huge project. It'd be one of the biggest engineering projects ever completed. But if we could complete it, then what you have then is a very, very cheap and regular way of getting people and materials into space. To make this dream a reality, a new ultra-strong construction material capable of sustaining hits from space junk and other threats must be invented. This would be uh, such an engineering feat that it's unfortunately just sort of uh, stuck in the realms of science fiction right now. But in theory, the physics does work on it. We just need to find a way to, we need to find a material that is incredibly lightweight to sort of form the, the elevator cable, um, the structure of the building, but that is also strong enough to not fall apart um, to be, because I mean, the, the tension forces required to hold this thing together would be enormous. It's the kind of incredible challenge that excites scientists everywhere. The space elevator would doubtless make a humble invention even more significant in world history than it was already. Once we could control it and make it stop safely, the elevator became our flexible friend. It's surprisingly adaptable. It can move boats. It can park cars. Fundamentally, the invention of the elevator has allowed us to accommodate many more people sharing the same piece of land. Elevators makes a huge difference in people's lives. In fact, I think we forget how much social impact some of these technologies had on our lives. And I think elevators are an example of a fantastic te technology. It has shaped our modern cities. It has enabled us to enjoy the view. And its future looks secure however high we aim to build. Yes, of course I can see a future for elevators. You know, as we continue to make taller and taller buildings, given the limited space we have on the ground, they're, they're going to be an important part of all building design. We'll develop it to reach as far as space, and we'll innovate and adapt it to fit whatever shaped environment on Earth that we want to create. People are always trying to improve it. And, uh, and when it doesn't work, you see just how dependent we really are on it in order to live our lives in modern high-rise buildings. I think the elevator is a great invention because just put simply, it allows the movement of goods and people. It allows us to build buildings in the sky and change the whole cityscape. And I think anything that helps people move from A to B who perhaps wouldn't have been able to do that is a great idea.